Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. So I apologize um, for our delay. Um, we um, were in our closed session a, a little bit longer, so um, we appreciate your patience. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Ms. Thomas, roll call, please. Dr. Bellamy? Here. Ms. Hill? Here. Ms. Walker? Present. Mr. Signer? Here. Ms. Galvin? Here. Are there any um, announcements? Um, I'll just follow up this. I think this was mentioned last time, but um, Mr. Alexan um, presents the fifth annual My Help List Contest, a thinking and writing and reading activity. Entries of 150 words or less to share in writing. It's important to help people because list five things that you've done to help someone or how you can help someone. Eligible to all students throughout the Charlottesville and surrounding counties in grades categories K through two, third through fifth, Six and eight, and then high school, ninth through twelfth. One winner from each grade category will be chosen and win a hundred dollar cash prize with a reception to be held in their honor. Winners will be announced on NBC 29 and alexand.com. It runs through Friday, April 19th. You can drop or send all entries to Carver Recreation Center under the title My Help List at 233 Fourth Street Northwest. Okay. Are there any other announcements? Um, just no announcements? Oh, no, no. Okay. All right, and we have a couple proclamations. Um, Mayor Walker, I'd like to defer my proclamation after yours. Could we have a moment of silence for the members of the Islamic community as well as reading yours? Okay. So if we could have a moment of silence, please, for those affected in New Zealand um, by the terrorist attack. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we have a proclamation that we want to present tonight. Um, in the wake of the horrific terror attacks at the mosque in New Zealand, the Charlottesville City Council reaffirms our commitment to the values of love and peace that led us to declare ourselves a welcoming city in 2016. We embrace our Muslim friends and neighbors. We celebrate their vital role in our community and we reject the hatred, extremism, and division they have too often had to suffer. And Madam Mayor, I think we have a couple of representatives from the Islamic Society of Central Virginia here to receive this. Um, would you come up, please? Let's give them a round of applause, please. It's our pleasure to be coming here tonight and to talk about how grateful we felt uh, in Charlottesville to be part of this community. When, when I woke up Friday uh, to the news, I initially felt saddened and slightly felt scared of going to the mosque. And it's because of the, the sentiments that have been brewing in our political atmosphere and it's not only anti-Muslim sentiments, it also goes to be anti-Semitic, anti-Hindu, anti-minorities, blacks, and Hispanic. These sentiments have been growing lately. And this act is not isolated, it's rather reflecting this atmosphere. But while this act receives a lot of media attention, what it feels, fails to receive is the generous reactions and contributions that we receive to our mosque. When, when I went to Friday prayer, I saw many new faces. A lot of them are non-Muslim who came to show support for our community. We, I saw many packets of flowers that were delivered, many kind letters and donations that were received by the mosque. And these things fail to grab media attention. When we look at the media, we only feel that this environment that we live in is very unwelcoming and unkind to all. 
but the reality is it's not like that. It's very welcoming and very accepting. But what this act indicates for us is the amount of hard work that we need to place on creating a welcoming society, a society that accepts all and respects all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we have another proclamation. <clears throat> Another proclamation for the 2019 Virginia Festival of the Book. And is that representative here to receive this proclamation? Oh, okay. Ms. Jane is here. All right. So whereas the city of Charlottesville believes that literacy is critical to active and engaged citizenship and is committed to promoting reading, writing, and storytelling for all, both within and outside its borders, and whereas reading stimulates the creative and intellectual growth of individuals while also building community through shared experiences, discourse, and understanding. And whereas, excuse me, the annual Virginia Festival of the Book draws attendees, authors, illustrators, and publishing professionals from the region, the Commonwealth, other states, and indeed the world, serving as a significant economically beneficial event for this area while providing the majority of programs free of charge to attendees and whereas Virginia Humanities, the Virginia Center for the Book, the University of Virginia, local businesses and schools, and cultural and civic organizations collaborate with the Virginia Festival of the Book to explore the world through reading, foster empathy for the stories of others, and promote literacy for all. And now, therefore, our Mayor, Nakia Walker, the mayor of the city of Charlottesville hereby proclaims Wednesday, March 20th through Sunday, March 24th, 2019 as the 25th annual Virginia Festival of the Book and encourage community members to participate fully in the wide range of available programs and activities. Signed on this 18th day of March by our mayor, Nakia Walker, and we have Miss Jane Lowe to receive the proclamation. Let's give her a round of applause. Sure, please. Um, thank you very much for this proclamation and the recognition. We know this is fairly boilerplate, that you know this is something that's sort of easy for you to get behind, but that does not take away from the fact that we appreciate your support and we appreciate this recognition every year. We're grateful for the city's <coughs> longtime support for the Virginia Festival of the Book. We know that city staff and counselors appreciate the value and the impact of the festival that it provides to city residents and to the entire community through accessibility to almost 135 free public programs, the diversity and inclusion of speakers and attendees, author presentations to thousands of Charlottesville students, and the many thousands of attendees who travel more than an hour to attend, including coming from 40 states and the economic value they provide to local tourism, restaurants, and hotels. We look forward to seeing you all at the festival this week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I will say, I know, Ms. Ms. Cunlop, there's a commitment to talking about equity as well as justice this year. Um, and there are several different events dedicated and predicated around both factors. So if you can, please come on out and enjoy. It's going to be some good stuff throughout the week. So I'm looking forward to seeing you all there. All right, thank you. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Is there anyone who would like to speak on the consent agenda? No. Um, Ms. Thomas, would you read the consent agenda, please? Consent agenda A, minutes, March 4th, 2019, special meeting, March 6th, 2019, special meeting, March 7th, 2019, special meeting, B, Appropriation, State Criminal Alien Assistance Program, SCAP, grant for 2019, $14,086, first of two readings. C, Appropriation, Domestic Violence Services Coordinator Grant, $49,336, first of two readings. Appropriation, Virginia Behavioral Health Docket Grant, $50,000, first of two readings. E, Resolution. Capital Funding Transfer for Smith Recreation Center Air Quality Project, $300,000, first of one reading. F, Resolution, 10th and Page Park Land Acquisition, $60,800, first of two readings. 
G, Resolution VDOT Programmatic Project Administration Agreement, first of one reading. H, Ordinance, Imposition of Fee for Fire Department Inspections, second of two readings. I, Ordinance, Telecommunications Franchise to MCI Communications, second of two readings. Okay. And colleague, just for the public's benefit, I just wanted to note that um, the minutes that were posted to be included in our packet originally um, have had to be curtailed just because of some technical issues that we've had with our minute software. So they will be available as soon as possible. I just know that they were originally intended to be included in this packet. So I just wanted to make sure the public knew that we recognize that those were not included in what she has just read off. Okay. Um, I would like to pull B for us to discuss um, later. Um, any opposed? Yes. All right. Is there a motion? Move to adopt the consent agenda. With with be pulled. With okay. be pulled. Mm -hmm. Second. <coughs> All right. Any further questions or comments? All right. Please vote. All right. So that carries um, five to zero. Um, next, we'll have the um, response to the co community matters um, from our March 4th meeting um, by interim city manager, Mr. Mike Murphy. Thank you, Mayor Walker. <clears throat> A few things that have been mentioned at uh, previous council meetings uh, that I want to follow up on this evening. Uh, the first is the uh, traffic situation, which has been of some concern at the Willoughby intersection. Uh, and uh, we have uh, been out there doing the uh, striping that has been recommended by the traffic engineer to make the uh, pathway or to make it more clear uh, what the pathway is. I believe the residents were concerned that perhaps we didn't have um, all of the uh, data about the number of crashes in that area. So. Uh, we did go back and pull that for the entirety of the last year, uh, March 1 through March 6th of this year. Uh, and we went two blocks on either side of that intersection. In total, uh, there were eight reportable crashes and 14 non-reportable crashes in that area. Uh, the definition of non-reportable for these purposes is any damage less than $1,500. Um, Actually, of the eight reportable crashes in this radius, only four were in the intersection we've been talking about at the council meetings. And three of the four um, were uh, rear end collisions by trailing drivers uh, who were at fault for not paying attention. So um, we, d we do have some good data. Uh, we're gonna continue to look at other solutions because we know that past this one year look back that there was a very serious accident with a fatality there. Uh, but I do want you to know that we uh, are providing the additional study that we had discussed uh, and that the traffic engineering department and public works continue to work on a solution. So, um, let's see, uh, we discussed benches uh, on the downtown mall and the cultural landscape, uh, making sure that that cultural landscape when it goes out analyzes uh, the return of benches and should that happen and where. Um, and what that design might be. Uh, but in the meantime, I had said to you, hey, we've got some of the old benches and we can see um, just how many of them are serviceable. Uh, and uh, since they are a design that was already approved by the BAR, we wouldn't have to deal with the issue about these backless benches that were installed in front of City Hall. And uh, after talking with Mr. Daly, it appears we have about 12 of those benches that we could put back into service. Uh, there are already locations uh, that were predetermined where those benches would be appropriate because as you know, the previous city manager in response to some public comment had those benches pulled out. So um, be happy to receive council's feedback, but it would be my inclination to work with Mr. Daly and install those 12 benches and primarily where they went out of were uh, Central Place and down by the Violet Crown. Um, is that correct, Mr. Daly? Yeah, so um, we'll look for the locations that are pre-approved. They would, as is the case, uh, you know, with the other benches on the mall, be bolted down. I know that, you know, in the way back, uh, they were freestanding and you could pull them around, uh, but with our issues with fire lane access and all that, a decision was made during the 
re-bricking that they would all be in place. Mm -hmm. So um, happy to take council's feedback on that after I get through these few items. Um, you all are aware uh, that we've talked about in a couple meetings having a pilot of altering the trolley route. Um, and so I want to make you aware of the results of that pilot, uh, which were conducted uh, a week ago today. So uh, essentially, we could alter the route and come straight down Main Street onto South Street, uh, making a left-hand turn onto 2nd Street and going straight through the mall crossing. This would call for the reversal of traffic on 2nd Street as currently you have to turn off of water to head up to south and it would be the reverse uh, in this case. There are a total of three and possibly four parking spaces that we would need to remove in order to execute this. Um, and so the first is as soon as you pull on to South Street, the, the two hour parking spot that is on South Street, the next is right when you want to turn left in this new uh, traffic pattern, uh, kind of in front of the South Street Inn. Uh, and then because we would move the uh, parked traffic from the east side to the west side of 2nd Street, we would lose one and possibly two spots because of how the street is constructed there. So. Um, again, this is something I'd love to have Council's input on. Uh, however, by policy, what we would do is post signs for the next 14 days about the potential of removing those uh, spots, uh, take public comment, uh, and we could either act from a staff perspective at that point or return it to council based on your pleasure. Um, let's see. Uh, there's been uh, some discussion uh, in chambers and, of course, uh, in the news about the posting of uh, our police data on the interactive website. Uh, I want to thank uh, Chief Brackney for her work in that regard uh, and make sure that the public and the council are aware that immediately after the initial launch, uh, we worked towards what our original intent was to uh, incorporate additional demography, chiefly uh, race and gender, and uh, all of that is now active uh, on our website. Um, finally. Uh, there's been some discussion here and via email about the Viet Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Uh, we have installed some general parking uh, directions uh, or uh, parking signs, uh, about seven or eight of them in that area. There is the request for some additional wayfinding. And chiefly what we still need to address is, um, you know, how do we continue to facilitate uh, better access if that is possible. Um, and so we are looking at a number of solutions. I know that one of the requests is a roadway and a parking lot. Um, there is a both a access and a cost and design uh, issue there. And so we are, I'll just be honest, looking at other solutions like uh, bringing people over there by other means of transportation, perhaps through a reservation system uh, in order to facilitate that access. So bring you back more on that at a future meeting. So if there's any questions you had on those uh, five items, happy to address them now. The efficiency of that providing transportation to, we don't know that yet. You still explore an option. Well, uh, that, that really becomes a, a, a policy matter for the council, whether they'd okay. like to enhance that service and the cost benefit. Mm -hmm. I think it's the stance of staff that, uh, you know, the, uh, the memorial was constructed and improved at the time of the Warner construction um, per ADA standards. And so it is suitable in that regard. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't realize there's a lot of the community discussion right now about whether um, the access point and the parking is too far away. Mm -hmm. uh, and should you want to entertain some solutions, I would say that um, some sort of uh, mm -hmm. shuttle reservation mm -hmm. system in a Polaris is going to be a much more mm -hmm. effective and efficient use of city resources than it would be to uh, construct a roadway mm -hmm. uh, from Melbourne Road all the way across the park or from the YMCA all the way across the park. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. there there are many ways to provide the access that's being discussed. Um, you know, it would be a matter of the combination of uh, resources and the council's pleasure. Okay. Mayor Walker, I have a question for mm -hmm. um, 
A any responses from the public with regards to the use of the pilot bus pilot down South Street? Uh, I've heard from uh, uh, several people who would be in favor of the idea. I did hear from one individual who left me a message at the manager's office that she did was not in favor of it uh, and didn't want to have an increase in bus traffic <coughs> or fumes on South Street. But overall, was there it was mainly positive or correct? Okay. Yes. Okay. So I would support. Um, the 14 days and then staff acting is that where where are you all at on the on the for the bus. trolley it was posting yeah I mean I it sounds like it's a good solution mm -hmm. uh, just procedurally uh, my main point is to confirm with you all that uh, based on the feedback staff will act or do you require another council agenda item I think staff acting is I mean I don't see the need for another agenda item Okay, thank you. And then we have the um, benches, right? Yes, ma'am. I would like to proceed forth with the benches. Yeah. That's as yeah, you okay. outlined, um, Mr. Murphy. Right. Okay, thank you. All right. So next we have um, community matters. Um, the first um, speaker is Ellen Farina. No. Ellen Farina. All right, next we have Harper Willingham. Harper Willingham. Um, next, we have Liz Reynolds. <coughs> I'm Liz Reynolds. I live in town. Good evening. Hi. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying that no one has the solution to racial inequity and injustice in this country and that there are a multitude of potential avenues working to decrease the disparities between whites and blacks in this country. Uh, I'm here to talk about just one of these avenues, the one that has been transformational for me uh, in furthering my awakening as a white person living in the racial hierarchy of our country. Since the beginning of 2017, I've participated in a white racial affinity group through the Insight Meditation Community of Charlottesville. Although my, most white people in America are unaware, uh, being white in this country, country comes with a heaviness, accompanied by a range of very difficult emotions. Shame, anger, defensiveness, guilt, frustration, hopelessness, apathy, overwhelm, and sadness, just to name a few. In white affinity groups like the one I'm a part of, we create a safe container in which white people, myself definitely included, can reflect, share, and learn about the deeper implications of being in the dominant racial group of this country. I've been involved in many racial justice initiatives in my adult life. Being a member of a racial affinity group that is based in mindfulness and meditation has been crucial to transitioning me from feelings of deep guilt, hopelessness, and overwhelm about racial injustice to a path of action and determination. Having a place where I can talk about the shameful, embarrassing, and politically incorrect thoughts I have and actions I take around race has allowed me to process many of the obstacles that were holding me back from working towards change. Since September of last year, I've been leading a class series through Common Ground Healing Arts Center at Jefferson School called A Mindful Exploration of, of Whiteness. It's a meditation-based class that uses Ruth King's work on meditation and racial justice as a foundation. I'm speaking to you today because Ruth King is spending several days with us in Charlottesville this week as part of the Festival of the Book. Ruth teaches nationally on meditation and racial justice and has been pivotal in leading our local Insight Meditation community to a greater understanding of why our group remains all white. And this is a pattern in Charlottesville, the all white institutions. Institutions and power structures have been and remain dominated by white people. There is much work to do amongst ourselves as white people, those in positions of power, both great, like the white members of city council, 
and the less powerful but still influential white people like teachers, business owners, and retirees in our community. Uh, I've brought copies of Ruth's book for all the council members, and I encourage you to pass it along, whether you read it or not, to others who might benefit from her wisdom. I've also included the dates and times Ruth will be speaking around town this week uh, and hope that you'll consider attending one of her events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have Walt Heineke. Hi, Walt Heineke. I'm 1521 Amherst Street. Um, I, I'm one of two uh, representatives from the People's Coalition on Criminal Justice Reform that's going to be speaking um, to you tonight. So uh, when I'm done with my um, statement, be prepared for part two. Um, so I just want to point out that next summer, the media will inevitably be back in Charlottesville asking questions about what has happened in the wake of 2017 in Charlottesville. What have we done? How have we responded to the to the to the um, the attacks of the white ethno ethno nationalists and the racists in this town? And how have we become awakened to our own complicity in generations of racial discrimination in this town? And I think you'll be able to point to at least two crowning policies. Uh, next summer when that question comes up. One of them is your stance on affordable housing, which we'll talk about later. Um, but the other one is your um, support for a civilian review board um, and oversight, a civilian review and oversight of the police. So our community has come together to define core elements of what we consider to be a meaningful CRB, and that is able to adequately fulfill our city's needs. We presented this list to the Interim Police Civilian Review Board during their last meeting, um, but we believe it's important for the counselors to hear this list as well. For each of these elements, we ask that the city attorney give us his opinion of whether it is achievable under current Virginia law um, in terms of what the, uh, the uh, CRB task force is, is uh, presenting. If you believe it is not, please provide us with a citation to the authority on which you base the opinion. Second, we ask that the city attorney explain how he would advise the CRB to achieve the articulated goals in its bylaws. If he believes the precise goal is not possible under Virginia law, he should suggest a mechanism for the bylaws to get as close to the desired end as possible. Uh, the following are the core elements of what our community considers to be vital powers and responsibility of the CRB. Because of limited time, I'll read off uh, the first core elements, and you'll hear from our second coalition speaker later. Firstly, the CRB membership should reflect Charlottesville's community with particular care given to representation of communities that have historically experienced disparate policing. Designating organizations and communities that get reserved seats on the CRB, for example, FAR, NAACP, Sin Barreras, Jefferson School, um, would be uh, um, desirable. The CRB will only have one ex officio retired member from, the, from law enforcement. The CRB must have investigative power. Specifically, the CRB should be able to perform additional investigations of complaints through an, a, an investigative staff and have the ability to compel the production of documents and people uh, and people, witnesses, in fact. The classic mechanism for this is subpoena power, but we realize other avenues may be necessary. Please note the broad definition of document, which includes cell phone and body camera uh, video as well. The CRB must have investigative power. In addition to our previous points in regard to this, we emphasize lastly that this investigative power must not be limited to determining whether internal affairs work was, was, it was sufficient. Uh, i.e. some uh, appellate jurisdiction, the CRB must be able to conduct a full and independent investigation. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you. I'm Susan Cruz. Hi. My name is Susan Cruz, and I have been a Charlottesville resident for 20 years. In that time, I have been active with both the environmental and social justice community. I worked at the Legal Aid Justice Center for 10 years, and I am now the Executive Director of the Charlottesville Climate Collaborative. The next 10 years will be critical for climate action, and the City of Charlottesville will be setting its emission reduction targets by June of this year. Through its climate action planning process, I believe that Charlottesville has the opportunity to stand out as a community, not just by setting a leadership goal, but also by the solutions we put forward to address community vulnerabilities. The intersection between affordable housing, transportation, and, and fossil fuel emissions is undeniable. And as global temperatures rise, 
so will energy costs. This will have a disproportionate impact on low-income communities who have the least ability to mitigate dramatic temperature shifts with energy efficiency upgrades and clean energy technology. Charlottesville's Climate Action Plan should address the need to provide sustainable, energy efficient, affordable housing in order to move our whole community forward. The first public comment period for city residents to weigh in on community-wide emissions reduction goal closed at midnight last night. The Charlottesville Climate Collaborative submitted three letters in that comment period. The first was on behalf of 41 local for-profit and non-profit businesses, representing nearly 3,000 employees, including businesses such as Centaur Martha Jefferson Hospital, the CFA Institute, Champion Brewery, and nonprofits such as Virginia Organizing and the Legal Aid Justice Center. We submitted the second letter on behalf of seven independent schools, including the International <coughs> School, Peabody School, and Village School. The final letter was submitted on behalf of 827 citizens, 422 of which were city residents. Each letter asked the city to set a leadership emissions reduction goal of 45% by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2050. Each letter also asked that the city conduct an emissions inventory every two years to keep us on track. The Charlottesville Climate Collaborative is well positioned to work with businesses who are ready to invest in sustainable practices, schools who are educating the next generation of climate leaders, and nonprofit organizations advocating for affordable housing, energy efficiency, food security, and climate justice. We believe that our work can support city and county leaders by convening sectors and developing common sense policy solutions. 2019 is an important year for climate action in Charlottesville, but the next 10 years will, de will truly determine whether or not citizens and local governments capitalize on this momentum to lead our whole community forward. I'm looking forward to working with each of you and city staff to build a climate action plan that builds energy independence, stimulates our economy, and protects vulnerable residents and our planet. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mary Carey. Good evening. Good evening. Mia Walker. Mary Curry City resident, as you know. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Murphy, for getting this pilot started. I think more people will get on board once they get the literature out because uh, I talked to a lot of people last week that rides the trolley, that gets off at 4th and Main and have to walk to Friendship Court and Red Street and Dice Street and stuff. So by that trolley coming down south, we just save them a couple steps. And like I was saying earlier, I saw uh, one of those big buses come out of 2nd Street the other day, 65 Passioner, take that wide turn and go down South Street so I know it can be done. Uh, last month was Black History Month, and Miss Gavin, I was thinking that you might have uh, had the decency to uh, apologize for what you said in November about Vinegar Hill and Star Hill being one and the same. But yeah, I don't know what happened, why you didn't do it. It would have been appropriate. And uh, Miss Reynolds stated a lot of things about. about uh, black disparities and things and, and and how people feel about things like that. That's black history. You don't go, you don't cross that line. You, you ought to leave your lane when you do that. But when, when you, all you had to do was just come out and say, I misspoke and um, I would like to let the black community know that I didn't speak about that. It wouldn't have took no skin off you. And see, when you go to Richmond, in which you trying to uh, you threw your hat in the rain to be a delegate, you got to understand that there's a lot of people that live in Richmond and from Charlottesville that know what you said and don't like it. And a lot of people in Charlottesville that are voters, black people and white people, that know what you said don't like it. And when you start going around talking about black history and, and you, you read it somewhere, I lived it. And I'm still living it. 20, 
365 plus one sometime. And see, I don't have this green on because I'm a le leprechaun. I got this green on because this represents Jackson P. Burley High School, which I attended. And, and see, a lot of my classmates from there didn't like what you said, Miss Gavin. It, it's not that nobody don't, don't like you because if they don't, hey, I'm happy. But I don't like what you said. And November, and this is March, and we're still waiting on our apology. If we can wait for 450 years for freedom, we can wait a couple more months for you to apologize. So when people that's looking at this go to the polls to vote, remember what I just said. Remember your black history. And remember how many people have tried to put it down and don't respect it, because I respect mine, and I'm going to stand as tall as I can. And Mr. Bellamy, thank you. you should back me up. Thank you. Thank you. Harold Foley. Good afternoon. Um, I get my time to win. Hello, my name is Lynn, City of Charlottesville, and I am the second representative for the People's Coalition. In continuing with the community's list of core elements of what we consider to be a meaningful CRB that is ad able to adequately fulfill our city's needs, I continue where our previous speaker left off. Again, I would like to reiterate that for can each... Oh, can you hear me now? Uh, I'm short. Okay, thank you. Again, I would like to reiterate that for each of these elements, we ask that the city attorney, one, give us his opinion of whether it is achievable under current Virginia law. If you believe it is not, please provide a citation to the authority on which you base the opinion. And two, explain how he would advise the CRB to achieve the articulated goal in its bylaws. If he believes the precise goal is not possible under Virginia law, he should suggest a mechanism for the bylaws to get as close to the desired end result as possible. Continuing with the community list of core elements. All police misconduct cases will come before the CRB, and the CRB will have full authority to resolve complaints against officers, including taking disciplinary action up to and including dismissal. If this is not possible, please explain who must retain final disciplinary authority and why. In addition, we prioritize the ability to make public robust data on policing. This involves monthly supervisory review of stop and frisk data, including CRB access to both summary reporting and raw numbers. And 14 days after a complaint is lodged, the department must make a publicly accessible statement of what actions have been taken and why. Also, the CRB must have adequate staffing and resources to fulfill its mandate. This includes, but is not limited to, the ability to access outside counsel, aka lawyers other than the city attorney, for the CRB when necessary, and for its auditing arm, hiring a staff person to do the auditing. And for our final two points, the CRB will report to and answer to the mayor and city council. And the CRB will be provided with semi-annual reports from the police department related to officer diversity and use of force training and annual reports on minority officer recruitment and hiring. Thank you. Um, ideal Akhtan. Hi. Hi. Good evening, everyone. My name is Idi Lakhtan. I'm one of the city residents. I'm here representing the Human Rights Commission of Charlottesville. As you know, the Human Rights Commission acts as an advisory body to the city council in matters pertaining to human and civil rights. Affordable and safe housing is one of those topics most frequently addressed by the commission, largely because there are frequent client encounters in the Office of Human Rights that try to address this issue. We have reviewed the Charlottesville Supplemental Rental Assistance Program that provides monetary support to those to, in low-income households to pay for housing. The Human Rights Commission has endorsed a resolution to continue, expand, and review the Charlottesville Supplemental Rental Assistance Program, or CSRAP. 
The resolution has stressed four key points. The first is to continue to provide funding to current CSRAP recipients. The second is to expand funding to cover all vouchers that are already provided. The third is to expand funding to cover applicants who are currently on the waiting list for vouchers. And the fourth is to ask for accountability of the program with a review of the CSRAP. We advocate that the City Council budget include continued funding for those citizens that already have received vouchers for rental assistance. According to figures from the Charlottesville Redevelopment and Housing Authority, or CRHA, which I'll refer to as such, from January 31st of 2019, there are 77 households currently living in housing supported by CSRAP. According to CHRA, it will cost 627000 to continue to support these families in the fiscal year of 2020. CRHA reports that 16 additional households have received vouchers and are currently searching for housing, and current funds do not fully cover the number of awarded CSRAP vouchers. We recommend the appropriation of additional funding to provide for all families who have already been given vouchers for the 2019 fiscal year. According to figures provided by CRHA, this would include appropriation of 131,000 for the fiscal year of 2019. <coughs> Additionally, we support increasing the funding for CSRAP in the 2020 fiscal year. At the end of January, CRHA reported 28 households are on the waiting list for vouchers. Supporting these individuals in the fiscal year of 2020 would require an additional $229,000. So to reiterate, to cover all voucher holders who are still searching for housing in this fiscal year of 2019, that would require an appropriation of 131000 To cover all current voucher holders plus those on the waiting list requires a total budgeted amount of 987000 for the fiscal year of 2020. And finally, our resolution supports a thorough review and assessment of CSRAP by the Neighborhood Development Services. We recommend this review to be done prior to funding appropriations with the goal to ensure that the figures are current, current and accurate and that the program is functioning as prescribed by the City of Charlottesville Affordable Housing Fund CSRIP grant agreement. At this time, I would like to invite all audience members who are in support of continuing and expanding the CSRIP program to please stand or snap. Um, and thank you for your time and attention. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. So just just as a, a just kind of for FYI, I'm the council rep on the Housing Authority Board. It's currently in the budget for us to continue funding the vouchers, and I think it's a dis. I'm talking in the mic. I think it's a discussion that we'll have to have with the Housing Authority. Maybe we, Mr. Duffield isn't here, but I see Mr. Collins from far. Um, in terms of expanding, because I don't think council has got that direct request, have we? So we would probably need to, from the from the housing authority board, place that on our agenda and then send that request to council. Um, it's my opinion, since I've been on the housing authority board, council has been rather generous in terms of uh, ensuring that the housing authority gets the funding that they need. So it's just that. In terms of continuing that, we just have to follow the process. So I'll speak with Mr. Duffield or Mr. Collins and some of my colleagues on the Housing Authority Board about the way in which we want to go in order to see some of the increase come to fruition. But I think we have to have a discussion about that first because there's some other things that we're working on as a Housing Authority Board that may complicate that. Yeah. If it's okay, Mayor Walker. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the comments from the Human Rights Commissioner. Uh, this is an area that uh, I was aware you all would be coming forward, so I've been asking questions both of our staff and Mr. Duffield. We actually have a meeting scheduled for next Friday, which is the 28th? 27th. 8th, 9th, uh, somewhere in there. Next Friday, how about that, 10 a.m.? Um, and so I will say that upon the initial examination based on the dates uh, at which council has uh, appropriated monies in the past that all of the figures that are being discussed and the numbers of people who are receiving rental assistance are your FY18 appropriation which means as I've discussed with Mr. Duffield just last week 
the entirety of $945,000 is available in this fiscal year for the remaining three months. So um, there is no shortage of funds. We would need to move that money out of the CAF, uh, Charlottesville Affordable Housing Fund, and appropriate it at a council meeting, uh, but that's not been requested by the housing authority at this time. So I want to say that, you know, $900,000 is level funded in uh, our proposed budget for all five of the years. So I would say that when you look at the 131,000 or the 200 plus thousand dollars um, and having the entirety of over $900,000 available for only one quarter, that we are well positioned to not only take care of the needs of the people in the program, but to lease additional folks moving forward. I do want to caution that uh, I'm very interested in an audit of the program. I'm working with staff on that because here is my concern as somebody who's interested in um, appropriately housing people and making sure they get the support that they need. Most best practice uh, in uh, any kind of housing or supplemental rental assistance would give you the capacity, at least should you need it, to serve people for up to 24 months. And as it stands right now, we did spend a lot of money in the first year without having uh, the backstop, but as it looks as though we've tapped none of the 19 money, we find ourselves in good shape. So just right. want to make sure that going forward that anybody who gets a lease if they have the circumstances where they continue to need rental assistance for us, that that is, uh, as we continue to recertify folks, possible for them to get that for up to two years. There will be people who will move or not need assistance for the full 24 months, and we need to be carefully tracking that in an audit so that we know when to unencumber those funds and allow new people to get leased up. So uh, this is definitely top of mind, uh, and I do think we have adequate funding to take care of the request. Right. Thank you, Mr. Murphy, for being on top of that. Thank you. Tanisha Hudson. Don't push the button yet. Thank y'all for that voucher stuff. People appreciate it. The community appreciate it. Tanisha Hudson, 711 Prospect Avenue. I want to talk about a couple different things. One, uh, Mr. Swingler, who runs Rose Hill Market, is requesting that two parking spaces on Rose Hill be designated for 15-minute parking so that people can come in and out of Rose Hill Market and Jones Heating and Air because the little cafe on Dale Avenue and Rose Hill Market. A lot of the people that go there are taking parking spaces. People are actually staying in these places and people can't park to get to his store. And we have similar parking setups in Belmont, Grady Avenue, and other little convenience store locations all throughout Charlottesville. The next thing is we do a lot of conversating about um, climate change and, you know, making Charlottesville a green city. Um, open source recycling is a place that takes a lot of old computers and uh, computer equipment from different businesses, and they recycle them, and they pass them out to low-income people who can't afford technology. They've been really um, grasping for some type of funding so that they can find a building since they've been displaced out of Virginia organizing due to politics. Um, so I think that's something that the city should definitely consider funding. I mean, there's no recycling place near Charlottesville. So when you think about dumping old computers, old laptops, once you actually swipe the information off of them, they're willing to take that equipment and then repair it and pass it out to people that need it. And not only do they give them a laptop or a computer, they fix it and replace it if it breaks or anything. Um, the next thing is property taxes in the city of Charlottesville because a lot of family members of mine are affected by this. If we're going to increase assessments due to new uh, developments and new buildings being put up around certain neighborhoods, we have to levy, you know, the 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 the, the tax levy needs to increase. So if right now the income limit, I'm just making up a number because I don't know the number. If the limit is $30,000, right, but 65? Mm -hmm. Is it 65? Okay, we probably need the highest. Oh, 65 is mm -hmm. the highest. Mm -hmm. oh, it's 50,000 right now. 50,000. Okay, 50, can we get it up to about 65 or maybe 66? That's what we're working on. 
for people mm-hmm. who, because I mean, we got to think about gentrification, right? Like this is one of the reasons why the city has been successful with allowing gentrification to happen. Taxes has always played a part. If you look at the Star Hill community, if you look at the Vinegar Hill community, if you look at certain communities, we know that this is the reason why they were able to take people's property. And I <coughs> had a meeting with some of you gentlemen, and you know I found some information that proved that very point on how they were going into these communities, Cedar Street, Run Street, Page Street, Pearl Street and taking people property because they owe twenty five dollars worth of taxes at the time. We don't want to allow that to happen moving forward. We want to do our best to try to keep the natives in the communities in which they chose to purchase their home. Yeah. Thank y'all. Y'all do you. you know what? Sorry, I need like ten extra seconds. Not everybody may be happy, but I feel like y'all are trying to right some of y'all wrongs. And I think people in the audience need to give the council, (coughs) the city manager, and everybody credit because they are doing some positive things. Whether people like it or not, I'm going to say it. Some of y'all ain't never going to be happy. (laughs) But but they are doing some good things. Thank y'all. Rosia Parker. (laughs) You must be freezing outside. We got a uh, compliment from Tanisha Hudson. It, check the weather. Where's the uh, Dave Rogers? It is, it is cold outside. Mighty, mighty cold. Um, but good afternoon. Um, good evening. Um, I want to talk about Rosie. I'm Rosia Parker, uh, a.k.a. Rosa Parks. So y'all want to see me tonight. Um, but I'm coming to you, Mr. Murphy, again about 8th and Main. 8th and Main is still, this has been three years. And it still has not been solved, even though it's been told that it's been solved, the problem still has not been solved. It's still more dangerous to get across that street. Um, I'm tired of bringing it to city council. I'm tired of hearing about all these other different neighborhoods getting all this um, good lookout, you know, with the crosswalks and traffic, this, that, and the third. I need that to be fixed. Um, CRB. I need the chief to apologize to the CRB board because still, like I say, I own minds when I'm wrong or I'm right. But when you have my whole board looking bad for something that the chief, they felt that two individuals are doing, call us out by name. Don't call my whole board out and make my whole board look bad, saying that the CRB is what's keeping the police officers from being hired when it's y'all's incompetency of paying y'all's uh, officers. Um, not only that, the data that was given last week just before the um, CRB meeting, as a citizen, I'm not happy with that. Don't put in the paper as a CRB member. As a citizen, put that, Nolan. Um, I'm not happy with that because that felt that to me that was just thrown out there. And I would like to know when is that process going to start? Was that process supposed to start particularly that day that it went out? Or when is that process going to you know, start? Because I haven't seen it been taken care of in any form or fashion of the process and the data that was given at that CRB meeting. Two, um, Y'all talk about how the CRB supposedly, like I said, in that paper when we was made to look bad. Well, let me go back on your officers. If we want transparency, we all need to be on one accord. Because when I have two officers coming at me in a CRB meeting that we weren't arguing about, Nolan, we was having a disagreement, um, I need um, not to be came at as an activist. I was an activist before I became a CRB member. I was a community leader and a community organizer before I did anything. But when I'm being told that it's not my right, that I can't say what I want at a protest, and I'm wrong, and I'm this, and I'm that, and then when one of my members have to speak on to another officer and lap to tell them that you're not going to disrespect two black women in here, we have a serious problem within your ranks of your police department. So I think that needs to come under control with 
your police department, and far as city managers, we need to have a damn good city manager that comes in here because if you keep holding up the wrongs of what your police department is doing, I think that is serious a problem. So, um, Ms. Parker, I have a question about the could you? It was one of your lieutenants, matter of fact. The data. What, yes, What was the concern? Just the way that it was presented, the way that everything came out, particularly just before that CRB meeting, in general. Like we should have had that information before that day, because, like I say, when did that process start? Is that process starting when it was launched? The new process that of the complaint procedure. Uh, how is it going to be done? It was that. When that was sent, that data that was presented at that meeting, was that when that that whole process took place? Or when is that process going to take place? Because that process has not been in place all this time. Okay. <coughs> you have your chief back here? No. Okay. Can we ask the chief when did that process start? Uh, Ms. Parker, I'll just say that thus far, all the responses that I've heard from the CRB about the Chief's presentation last Tuesday were positive. Uh, I'm happy to but take that, your feedback. But not and, all. But uh, that's what I'm saying. Not all of us were happy. Because, understood. like I said, as a citizen, so, and as being said. still in those areas, that don't affect my whole CRB board. Mm -hmm. It affects me as a citizen. I'm speaking as a citizen, not a CRB member. Understood. So that's what I'm saying. When did that policy take effect when it was presented that day? Or has that policy been in effect this whole time? No, that's I, what we need to know. Yeah. As we have discussed, uh, you know, previously, last Friday, or whenever we most recently had a... Uh, media discussion about uh, reforms in the police department uh, after Chief Brackney came here in June and after we got past August uh, she set herself to a complete review of department protocols including internal affairs uh, and including transparency with the data and so all of those have been uh, in the works for some time they did not happen uh, simultaneous to your well, meeting obviously on Tuesday. the complaint process must have happened simultaneously because we have been coming back a couple of times in the last few months since January, continually bringing back, um, 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 asking about what's going with the complaint process. Why are things being regenerated? Why is things being this and why are things being that? But what was presented to us is not saying that these are the things that are being done. It's saying that these processes are going forward as if nothing has been wrong with what's been going on with the complaint process. Yeah. That is false. We're in complete agreement that the closure of cases during 2017, 2018 were unacceptable and that the chief we has taken that, steps but as to a citizen, change the process. But as a citizen, I understand that y'all are saying that it was um, whatever you're saying it is, but still something still isn't right because the citizens of Charlottesville still do not know what the indications, what took place. I mean, you can't say pers with personnel files. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But still, as a citizen, we do not know what is being, what is uh, the disciplinary actions that are being taken with the police officers. We don't feel that it's helping us any because all it's doing is going around in internal affairs and it goes back to you. So as a citizen... So as a citizen, we still need to have, like, they, like ditto to Walt and what Lynn said about these reports that need to go out. We need to have that because what she said and what's being done, it's not. So your complaint now is that you don't, you all are requesting to know what the actions are on complaints. Okay, so now... That was what, what I'm saying is what was presented to us in the CRB meeting is not the process of what's been going on in the complaint procedure. Okay. So we're, have you already what we're saying discussed is this with some, Mike? This is what I'm saying now. This is what I'm asking. When did that policy start? Okay. So because did it, that's why I say did it start the day that it was launched, as he said, when it came out to the CRB? Because... We've been to this mic quite a few times in Jan since January. 
bringing the same stuff back up about these complaints. Mm. And even in the reports of certain things from the chief. Okay. What was presented is not running concurrent as to what's being told to us as citizens, what was presented, and actually the actual process. Okay, so could you and Mr. Murphy connect to see? I don't have no problem. That's why I asked. Okay. When did this start? That's why I was asking, would he be able to ask her when it started? Mm. Because if if it started that particular day, as a citizen and the citizens who listen to what was presented from the newspaper, a lot of us, not just saying me in particular, we're not seeing that. Okay. I so just, that's what I'm saying. I, I'll just say that uh, you know we have made some. Do, are y'all uh, not understand what I'm saying? We've made some changes to the process mm-hmm. in order to improve the citizen response yeah. and in order to be transparent. It's my understanding that those uh, same files that the CRB received are online. And as each case is closed, they will be updated, yes. and it will be known what the disposition of each of the cases were. Will you know uh, in the case where somebody was uh, there was a sustained finding what the discipline was for a particular we know, officer? We will find you it. will not, yeah. but you will know in each case with each date whether it was sustained, exonerated, etc. But that's the problem because a lot of everything has always been exonerated, 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 exonerated. So and you're saying that you all don't agree with the outcome, and that's the question. Exactly. Okay. So, because everybody is being exonerated, so it's, it's it's made to seem that the citizens are lying as they're putting these complaints. So I was in the room when um, the chief went through the list and read that there were actually cases that had been sustained too. Yeah, but not as many. Okay. Very, not so, very, very, very little. Very little. But I'm just saying, compared to what's been shown and the complaints that have been put forth. Not only with, you know, now I'm not work, talking about Miss Turner's complaints. I'm talking about other ones that have went, you know, that we okay. have been dealing with. And, right. it's, you know, they're not seeing the same thing. And it, like we said, we're steady coming back with the, you know, the generated every 30 days, you know, generation, generation. So, it, but right. she's saying that it's not coming through this way. Okay. But that's what I'm saying. What was presented and what was told how the process goes is not how the process is you know, okay. actually going. So that's why I'm just trying to ask, when did the process start? All right. Thank you. All right. Peter. Good evening. Peter Krebs, uh, Piedmont Environmental Council and City Resident. Um, first of all, I wanted to just uh, endorse that um, trolley reroute pilot. I think it's a great idea, and I love when you guys just try stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Tonight, I just wanted to talk about two um, opportunities that are bike pedestrian related this week. Um, This Wednesday, Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission is hosting a public meeting on the Fifth Street Trails project. The scope of the project's changed a little bit, and they're going to talk about it and have a discussion. That's Wednesday, 4.30 to 6 at TJPDC's Water Street Center, which is 407 East Water Street. The second event is Friday evening. Uh, PEC is co-hosting a social with Safe Routes to School at uh, um, Three Notched uh, Brewery and Restaurant. Uh, there will be volunteers fixing up the city's uh, school's bike fleet, and people ask me, do, do the city schools actually have bikes for the kids? And the answer is yes, they do. They'll be fixing up the bikes and a portion of all sales will go to buy more bikes for city schools. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ken Edwards. Good evening. (laughs) Good evening. Good evening. evening. How y'all doing? My name's Ken or Kendrick Edwards. I am a city resident. I'm here this evening to talk about the rising tax assessments. The rising tax assessments need to stop because many people have been displaced from their homes and or will be displaced or forced to sell 
Uh, let me just share with you how fast my assessments number have changed over the years. Y'all ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 1997, 55,000. 2,000, 58, 60,000, 64,000, 121,000, 183,000. In 2005, 220,000. 2006, 269,000. 2007, 311,000. 2008, 342,000. Uh, it dropped a little bit in 2020. 10, 2011, uh, 301,000, 2012, 312,000. Uh, let me move up a little bit. 325, 2017, 338, 2018, 365, and 2019, 414. Just want to share a little story with you. My oldest brother lives in Oklahoma, and he has 80 acres. And I know Oklahoma is not Charlottesville, but he has 80 acres, two houses and a barn on it. The last time I checked with him, I paid more than he did on his taxes. And he has 80 acres, and I have .1620 of an acre. Let me share with you what else needs to be looked at. Some years ago, uh, my wife Holly, that's the mayor's friend, went to an open house, and as soon as we walked in, the realtor told us, oh, this house has been sold. And the realtor goes on to say, and the people who offered, the uh, people who bought the house, basically started bidding on the house. It could have been 100000 but after they finished, and somebody came in with a whole lot of money, they could have paid two or 300000 which I know factors in to what? the tax assessment, because tax assessments are based on the price the houses sell around. So when you got people coming in who have a whole lot more money than many people in this city, that's a problem. Some folks from other areas are so desperate to live in Charlottesville that they'll pay anything. Let me wind up here. But you can't expect people that work at UVA, restaurants, school teachers, police officers, EMT, fire departments, personnel, rent, to be able to purchase a home with skyrocketing assessments. Uh, so we need to look at that. And I also encourage you to partner, uh, to help folks become homeowners by partnering with uh, Habitat. In other words, hook them up with some dineros, amen? amen. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, please look at those high rising tax investments. One more thing. Somebody tore down a house not too far from me and built a new one. Guess what the tax assessment on the new house is? 620000 You used to be able to buy a house in Belmont for $60,000. Have a good night. Thank you. Myra Anderson. Myra's not here. Uncle um, King. So I don't see. So is there anyone else who would like to um, speak? Trey Biasioli, city resident. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity to address council this evening. I wanted to talk about the city's climate policy and our uh, recently closed comment period on the greenhouse gas emissions report. Okay. Um, this is a great time to be addressing climate change. There's been a lot of research that has come out recently, both at the federal level and the international level, showing the importance of addressing it urgently and the challenge of going ahead and doing so in a way that will leave a uh, just, equitable, habitable planet for our children. Like many others who have come before me, I want to emphasize that the city should be a leader in adopting aggressive climate goals, and we should have regular targets that we go ahead and monitor on a biannual or, or other regular basis. But I don't want to reiterate what a lot of other people have addressed to council before. I want to talk about a specific issue that hasn't been addressed much, and that our policies seem to run counter to. Specifically, it's our ownership of a fossil fuel utility, Charlottesville Gas. We operate it like a conventional fossil fuel utility. We provide incentives for the adoption of fossil fuel infrastructure, 
and we spend advertising dollars to go ahead and incentivize its use. Last fall, as it does every couple of years, the Charlottesville Gas went ahead and sent out mailers to non-gas customers, such as myself, within the Charlottesville Gas Service area. Extolling the supposed benefits of gas usage in homes and encouraging the installation of gas-fired appliances. We continue to offer free hookups to gas service for residences in the area, a subsidy of several hundred dollars per residence. So we both spend money advertising these fossil fuels and we incentivize their adoption by providing infrastructure free of charge to homeowners. There once was a time when natural gas may have been the cleaner fuel from a climate perspective, but those days have passed. As our grid, as our grid has gotten cleaner, as we've added wind and solar and we've retired a lot of coal plants, electric options are by far cleaner than natural gas furnaces, water heaters. Heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, electric induction stoves, they're both better for indoor air quality and they're both better from a climate perspective. Nonetheless, we continue to go ahead and advertise and incentivize natural gas adoption. That trend is only going to continue as the grid gets cleaner, as we add more wind, solar, and low carbon resources. There's a growing recognition that electrification of building appliances is going to be an essential and cost-effective step in addressing any sort of aggressive climate goals. The Public Utilities Commissions of, of California and Massachusetts have emphasized building electrification. The government of the United Kingdom recently proposed a ban on, uh, on natural gas-fired home heating appliances starting in 2025. So this is not just the activists proposing these changes, this, these are the bureaucrats speaking in this manner. So I have three recommendations for the city and res with respect to Charlottesville Gas. One, stop incentivizing fossil fuel usage. Remove our incentives for going ahead and installing infrastructure. Switch the incentives. Encourage the use of cleaner electric-based appliances such as heat pumps and heat pump <coughs> water heaters. And three, commit to a zero carbon future for Charlottesville gas. Get us off of natural gas and uh, reduce the demand for it and switch to a clean, renewable fuel for home heating. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we have Jehu Martin? Um, Andrea Massey? Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Very briefly, my, my name is Jeff Fogel. I live in Belmont. I just wanted to respond to Mr. Murphy's comments about transparency because I see that as one of the principal issues in Charlottesville. Mr. Murphy and I, I think this probably applies to a lot of you and other people in the city leadership who have misused the term transparency. Complying with the law is not transparency. And that's all you're saying is that public information, which is required to be kept and given to the public by the police department is proof of transparency. It's not. What's proof of transparency is when you give up something that FOIA doesn't require you to give up. So far the city claims transparency and all it does is comply with the law and you call it transparency. That's not transparency, that's called complying with the law. Let's use transparency for its intended purpose, which is to show us things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see. And that's what's consistently the issue with the police department and in many other respects with this community. Now, one of the things that was learned at the last CRB meeting was this notion that you could not reveal anything in anybody's personnel file is not a requirement of law. It's a policy decision, apparently, that was made by the city manager which is apparently not reflected in any writing, in any minutes that I'm aware of, or in any other discussion. So the question is, should we have a policy that further limits transparency? Is that what Charlottesville stands for? Because that's what's happened as a result of the policy of the city manager's office. Do you see that changing? Do you see yourself getting at least equal to what the task is? Do you see yourself actually giving us transparency? Do you see yourself taking away a rule that's been established by your office that is not reflected in any writing and has no source? Those are my questions. 
So I would say since I was at the CRB meeting that right after the CRB meeting, um, Chief Brackney and I had the discussion. Um, the city attorney had uh, made a statement in the meeting um, and we haven't met yet to discuss what um, the possibilities are because we haven't had time since the meeting, but the discussions did, did start based on the statement, the presentation, the statement that was made. So um, I know that people like things with snap of fingers, but there are people that are listening, asking questions, asking for clarification, and trying to come up with solutions. Um, there doesn't seem to be a space for the fact that there's a process to things. I don't think anybody's trying to hide anything. We're discussing it. Um, yes, I am. There was a presentation. For this issue for 10 years. So there was a presentation. The city attorney made a statement. We are now having discussions about how to make and what we can make happen. It's a discussion. So unless we come back and say nothing has come of that discussion, I don't think anybody should be thinking that we're trying to hide something because we started having a discussion right after the meeting. You all haven't met again. The CRB hasn't met again. And so I think there's just the level of impatience um, and to just say that we are doing the same things that's been done. Transparency, I don't think, um, and I am actually questioning that because even with what I thought coming in, that it could mean how irrational some people, including you, Jeff, have been, has been quite harmful to a lot of processes. Irrational about what? Jeff. Nikai. Yes, completely irrational. Okay. Yes. That's a ridiculous statement. That's fine. Back it up. You just can't throw them That's fine. Up. I wouldn't throw them out about you. Okay. That well, apparently that's not the case. I just had started a conversation with you about your statements. So anyway, we are attempting to work on it. We are attempting to have the conversation based on what's allowable, what, you know, some of my questions are, how are police protected? Do we know that that is what they have hired someone to protect them? Can, what can we do um, that will not completely undo anything the CRB comes up with? There are, I think, a lot of components to this. We're trying to figure it out. Nobody's trying to hide anything. Again, I will say we started the discussion soon as the presentation. I, you all were in the room. Um, Chief Brackney made her presentation, and then um, the city attorney made a statement after that that didn't, that they were um, contrasting statements. And so I immediately followed up. And that's, that's where we are. So I can okay. speak from a complaint. No, because please. I think that she's doing a, a decent job in getting the letters out consistently. Okay. If they so need more time. I just wanted to just say that I heard you all. I started the discussion about the, that particular issue, and I would like for you all to give us time as a group to figure to figure an answer out. That's my that's my um, statement. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? You can come on up. Hello. My name is Jane Fletcher. I live at 527 Park Plaza. <clears throat> I want to talk about real estate taxes. I live in a wonderful neighborhood, but I live in a very modest home. I have one bedroom, one bathroom. Unfortunately, it's a very desirable neighborhood. It's in North Downtown. 21 years ago, my real, my real estate taxes for the year were $1,100. This year, they're over $6,000. It's only going to take six more years to hit $10,000. I will have been retired by that time. One reason this neighborhood is so good is because there are lots of different aged people there. 
There are lots of retirees. That makes our neighborhood safe because people keep an eye out for other people. It's not a neighborhood where everyone is gone for eight or nine hours a day. And I just feel so sad that I'm going to be driven out of this neighborhood. I haven't received any additional services. Just the taxes go up. Every, I did the math, and the average increase per year is 9%. Well, 9% of $1,000 is not the same as 9% of $6,000. And so it will go up a lot faster the higher the taxes are. The only thing I can think of is that the budget needs to be constrained. It needs to go down. And there are offices, there are situations where the county has an office and the city has an office. There's no reason why those can't be, those two offices can't be merged together. For instance, parks and recs. I had business with parks and recs. It took me hours to go to two different offices. I shouldn't have had to do that. Why are we paying for personnel? two different offices when it's such a small amount of people. So there are lots of ways to save money. I'm not the expert on that, but I will tell you that if something is not done, it's going, there's going to have to be a revolution here. And we are at the breaking point. I wish I had come a couple years earlier but we are at the breaking point. Thank you. So, ma'am, are you familiar with the uh, city's um, tax assistance program? I do not qualify for the okay. tax assistance. Until you retire, okay. I will not qualify when I retire. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's just my dream to stay here, and I will not be able to stay here. Okay. At 9% increase every year. My taxes will be over $5,000 as well. Okay. Like the assessments are not going to increase at the same level that they did the past few years. They don't, no. Yeah. Right, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Nancy? Katrina, um, Ms. Turner, Nancy was up, so then after her. Okay. <clears throat> Not too long, but my name is Nancy Carpenter. I live in the Rose Hill neighborhood. I want to thank Ms. Hudson for bringing attention to a potential parking issue there at uh, Rose Hill Market. I hope that the traffic engineer will agree with her and uh, provide uh, Mr. George with, you know, parking for his uh, patrons of his store because he's an important part of that neighborhood. I also want to thank uh, uh, Mr. Murphy and the bo uh, board for um, looking at putting back the uh, benches that have backs on them uh, that were taken out. I remember those conversations several years ago, how the Downtown Business Association just didn't want to have a lot of poor people hanging around the downtown mall. Seems like that's still um, a situation. The other question I have is, uh, is, is for the city manager, um, trying to still determine if that uh, Vinegar Hill plaque that was attached to the retaining wall near the code building has been returned to Parks and Rec. It has, okay, uh, what will be, will the uh, uh, construction company uh, put that uh, re uh, area back as it was after construction? Because that was supposed to be repurposed for a park to memorialize Vinegar Hill. Um, there hadn't been any money put towards it, but it was in a, a plan. And I want to make sure that uh, that area is uh, put back in the condition it was so that the plan can go forward with um, putting that as a park to people who lived, actually had footsteps, footprints in that area uh, instead of the way it looks now. And the other thing is, and this, uh, talking about parks, I'm still a little um, peeved that uh, Washington Park doesn't have any money put towards any improvements to that area except for standard maintenance. Um, to the buildings and the grounds. It's, I went, when I drove by there the other day coming to work, the, the swim building just looked tired. 
It just looked like something out of another century. I think it could certainly could, should put some money uh, in putting uh, a, a better face on the park because after all, you're going to have all those people at Dairy Central who want to have some place to walk their dog. And I would hate that the only time that the park gets updated is when a lot of uh, people move in that are at a very higher economic level than a lot of people living in that na around those neighborhoods right now. So let's, you know, maybe the next fiscal budget look at actually putting some more money into Washington Park and, you know, making it a gem like it should be. Thank you. Thank you. So money, yeah. The vice mayor has asked me just to address one of Ms. Carpenter's <coughs> comments, and that is that, um, yes, the western end of the mall was intended to be an area acknowledged as Vinegar Hill Park or Plaza, um, and as it stands currently, um, should there not be any new design for that area, the contractor will be obligated to return it to the condition it was in before. Um, I think most of the interpretation that would happen to make that a park or plaza would actually not be a plaque that is this size, but uh, actually a series of signs uh, throughout the area that are much larger uh, that would go through um, the Historic Resources Committee, and that work started um, under the previous staff person, Mary Joy Scala, so, uh, and has been considered in public meetings in the past. So certainly there's lots more that can be done there from the um, entrance, kind of where Whiskey Jar is, all the way up. Okay. Katrina Turner. Um, I just want to speak real quick about what Ms. Parker said. Um, as far as what was presented to us, um, because when I filed my complaint, I had to come back in front of city council in order to hear anything about my complaint. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of part of what we're talking about this um, system, you know. Um, and plus, last year, if you could recall, you asked the chief to write me a letter stating that she did not view a videotape of my son's arrest that she only looked at a picture of my son's arrest. I haven't gotten that. That's been probably, what, five, six months now? And when she presented, you know, the complaint form, well, the complaint, um, the I think the sustained part of a complaint, like if you make a mistake on a report or something, the disciplinary disciplinary actions, that's supposed to go against you. She made a very big um, mistake when she wrote and said she looked at a videotape and only saw a picture. I'm, why haven't I gotten that letter yet? Is that going to hurt her by admitting that she made a mistake, as they said, that bad? Why haven't I gotten this letter yet? Because, like I said, when she presented what she printed, presented last week, she should be in trouble for putting that down on paper. So why, what's going on? You know? Am, am I going to get that letter stating that she didn't make a mistake, that she lied about watching that video? That's not a mistake. You cannot mistake looking at a video and looking at a picture. You can't do it. So I just want to know why I haven't gotten that letter yet. That's all. So I think we discussed um, here the fact that um, the language in the video, I mean, the language in the letter you received was in, I think you answered that there was no potential for a video to be, that the it was pre-body camera, that the you, there was no dash cam footage. Didn't we, we, didn't we have that discussion? Here. Wasn't she supposed to write me a letter stating that she did not look at that video as she stated? Okay. Stated. All right. We'll discuss that. Because she was supposed to have written me that letter, and I want my letter. So you're okay. I, I, I mean, right. because that's more than a mistake. I mean, she's the chief of police. And if I was to have put something wrong down on a complaint, I would be in trouble for it mm -hmm. if I lied on a complaint or if I lied about a decision, I would be in trouble. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So come on now. I mean, not. We'll certainly follow up on this specific request about whether a letter was sent. Uh, as Ms. Turner is aware, she has received an answer. It's been reviewed by three different police chiefs and two city managers. So I, I mean, the, the disposition of the case, as I understand it, is no longer in question. It's a matter of the follow-up that you're asking about this one element. The disposition really, um, I have a recording from, from oh, Chief do. Thomas that anytime I can find a lawyer, I can get every last bit of information in my complaint, but I haven't been able to find a lawyer. So evidently, it's going to stay open from how the Chief Thomas told me because these records will always be here for me to get. And okay. I have that on record. Thank so you. So these records are here for me. Why can't I get them without a lawyer? Is what I want to know. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? <coughs> Excuse me. Good evening, Council. Hello. Uh, how are you, ma'am? Um, <clears throat> to, to piggyback many of the other uh, citizens who've come up about taxes, um, <laughs> we presently live in a, in a house that is over 100 years old, and yet in the last two years our, our assessment has gone up $52,000 with no structural changes, no, no, no enhancements to the facing of the property, nothing, but it's, it's gone up some $52,000. The only thing that has changed is the Dairy Central project, which is right around the corner from where I live. So this, this takes me back to the conversation I had with you all some time ago when this was being first bantered about. What it does to a neighborhood when a developer comes in and puts up a project like this, it drives up the tax base and then in many cases makes it impossible for the residents to continue to live there because they can't afford the additional taxes that come with it. So once again, in perpetuity, we need to allow for residents in these areas that are affected by these types of, de of development plans to, um, to, to not be so adversely affected and not be forced out of their homes because again, it just equates to, to, to backdoor gentrification. People are best being driven out because they can't afford to pay the taxes on the homes that they've done nothing to, that they've done nothing wrong with, other than they live in an area that was affected by development. So please, I ask you, you know, remember and look into the look look inwardly and realize that the most valuable resources we have here in Charlottesville aren't the, the hotels and the restaurants that 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 litter the skyline. That it's not UVA and it certainly isn't those grandiose granite giants that that brought the hatred here a couple of years ago. It's the residents. That's the city's most valuable resource. And that's what needs to be protected. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gavin. Mr. Gavin. Just because um, I think some people, I don't think everybody's going to be here when we have a discussion. So I'd just like to say this briefly. So we've been talking about this for some time. And just from my personal position, I hear you wholeheartedly. My assessments went up as well. But it's twofold. Because we hear from a lot of people that there needs to be a commitment to affordable housing. The city has for a long time not done what we're supposed to do for the same population that you're talking about in regards to providing housing, in regards to providing subsidies. We heard an uh, eloquent statement from um, the Human Rights Commission, which I think is in agreement with members of the Low Income Housing Coalition and several other groups about why there needs to be an emphasis from city council to put a priority to address affordable housing. Well, in order for us to be able to address affordable housing and put many of the dollars in, we have to find a revenue stream or a revenue source. So for me, I'm, I'm really confused because I hear from some people and I'm not I'm, I'm having this discussion with you, but mm -hmm. it's not just for you. Obviously. I hear from some individuals address affordable housing. Do what we have to do to make sure people aren't displaced. Do what we need to do to make sure that we address these housing needs. So then when we try to find the revenue to be able to do just that, it's like, no, find it another way. But there aren't many other ways. So, like, how would we, because I really want to hear from the public. If we don't go up in the mill tax to have a dedicated revenue, if we don't go up with the real estate tax, if we don't look at the lodging tax, 
monies that are going to be able to address affordable housing, home ownership, homelessness, then what would you all like for us to do? There's, there's no reason that we, we can't attack and approach all of those things. We, we, we're, we're approaching the, the, the point where there are hotels on almost every corner. And we've raised the, and we're proposing raising the lodging and, tax and for we, and we, hotels. And we need to look at that. But we don't need to, to drive up the revenue for affordable housing if we don't have anybody that will be able to live here in town. Because if we, if we, if we, if we drive, continue to drive the real estate tax up for the existing residents, we, we won't be able to, to have anyone to live in town that can afford the affordable housing that we're trying to create. So that, too, so, is a double-edged sword because Mayor Walker has presented a plan through the chat. I don't want to make sure I said it correctly, the chat. chat. Mm -hmm. Through the chat, mm -hmm. which is, uh, and I think we've, we've been discussing, and I think there are votes to do so, to provide funding to alleviate some of the stress for those who fall under a certain <coughs> threshold to get tax relief. So that's our effort to be able for those who you're describing who don't have the income to be able to stay here and remain here, those who may be on a fixed income if it's under a certain threshold, we want to provide funding to be able to keep you here. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, we have to be able to generate revenue to address these needs that everyone literally for the last two years have said that we must address. Well, then, look, we've got to, we've got to focus on affordable housing and our low-income residents. Mm -hmm. That's got to be priority number one. Okay. Because we, we've got to be able to take care of the people who, who need it most and who deserve it most. I agree. Priority number one. But we've got to also be able to create an avenue to take care of the existing residents who, once again, are being directly affected by something that they've not, that, 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 that they had no part in. Right. So and that's what the time is for and the rental assistance is for. Okay. But any time that a development comes into the area or a developer comes into the area, number one, they're seeking tax breaks, first of all, and, and we can't allow that to continue to happen because they're going to make their money, rather it's on the front end or the back end. Okay. They're going to get their funds. So, you know, if, they, if, they're looking for, if they come in looking for tax breaks, tax breaks just to build, that's a problem. Okay. That's, that's a problem. So we've got to, again, take care of the people who would be directly, directly and adversely affected by these developments coming into, into locales, whether it's on whatever corner and whatever the developer is and whatever it is that's going up, unless it's affordable and low-income housing. And once again, you know, I, what's affordable in Charlottesville, I, I don't know. I mean, God bless folks who have moved to the $15 an hour uh, uh, salary, but understand, that still puts you at a threshold below $32,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And there's no way that anybody will be able to live on $32,000 a year in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. It's just not possible. But we've got to we, – we, we, I can't believe that it can't be done. There's some brilliant minds up here. And, and, and I can't believe that we can't put our heads together collectively and come up with ways and, and, and be creative – that we can, <clears throat> again, not drive up the, the, the tax base of people who are trying to live and let their generations and families continue to live in those same homes, but still be able to, to find affordable avenues and venues for the low-income folks. Right, and you're saying and, find and the solutions. That's <coughs> what the CHAP and the rental assistance is for. Okay. Can I ask a question of, of um, Mr. Blair? When Mr. Gathers is done. I'm sorry? Yeah. Are when you're you? done. Okay. Oh, thank you. Right. I'm not done. Yeah. Brother, but, but, <laughs> all right. All thank right. You. Thank you. I love you too, brother. <laughs> um, and, and Mr. Blair, I, if you need time to think about an answer, but um, I think a big driver, when, at least what I've been hearing, is a big driver for the assessments has been the, the cost of the luxury student housing. And there was a major uh, change of ownership uh, in 2016. One of the luxury student housing developments on West Main Street, which gave rise to a huge jump in land value. And that has had a reverberation across the entire city. Can we have a moratorium on luxury student housing? Can we uh, uh, put that 
because that seems to be, what I'm hearing is that that is exacting like an enormous, an enormous price per acre just to, to sell land. And so that's leading a lot of property owners to hold their land in speculation until they get the next big offer for a luxury student housing development. And these are developers from outside the city. And, and can you be that selective or is it, can we change the zoning wholesale like sooner versus later to not allow luxury student housing or can we prohibit special use permits for luxury student housing? You build it. Well, <laughs> uh, concerning your question, a couple points. <clears throat> Number one, the Virginia Supreme Court has held you can't have a general moratorium on development. Okay. Um, concerning luxury student housing, I do think, as you were stating, a lot of these are subject to special use permit and rezonings, and that's, that's something for the council to consider when those applications come before it. Um, but I don't believe and I'm happy to research this, but I do know the Virginia Supreme Court has ruled there cannot be a general moratorium on development in localities in Virginia. But this is a and specific And you're talking kind about a specific use. kind of use. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I think uses themselves per the zoning code obviously are at your discretion as a council. Um, I think a question about luxury student housing is how you would define that. And when you talk about multifamily versus student housing and whether there can be a distinction on that or, or whether mm. there couldn't be, I mean, I think that would be a, an issue you would run into. But I'd be happy to research that. Is there any other interest in that? I, I would have interest. Okay. I would have interest. And could I ask? Uh, when you say luxury student housing, I mean, is there a certain, are you looking at it's price a, it's points? It's over a, price, a certain price point with amenities built in. Okay. Right. Madam, Madam Mayor, Mayor, Mayor. Can I, uh -huh. How much does UVA, UVA actually pay the city in tax? So, <laughs> so zero. <laughs> zero. I have one other question no, from Mr. That's Mr. another front of negotiation. Mr. Madam Mayor, just uh, Mr. Murphy, just because there were so many, there were so many questions here about assessments. I thought it might, if you could, spend two minutes telling the public how the assessor's office works, because I think there there was an assumption here that council is involved with assessments or can and 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 we're not, but but also how appeals work so that folks can understand that because a lot of a lot of people are watching. There's a lot of interest in this. So. Uh, the city does have a office of the assessor. Uh, it is located uh, uh, next to the city space underneath the uh, Market Street parking garage. Uh, people who have questions about how their assessment is generated uh, or uh, if it is correct uh, certainly have the right to appeal in any given year. I don't have the guidelines about the timing of that appeal uh, in front of me, but certainly. Guidelines over for this year. Well, where? Thank you. Uh, we can certainly uh, talk to Mr. Davis about uh, how that date is established. Uh, I've not uh, been asked about any appeals, although certainly it is known to us what the volume is of appeals in any given year. Uh, and we actually estimate that in the budget uh, for a certain number of those appeals to be granted. So we, we do know that on occasion uh, that the process does change the assessment. Uh, it is true, uh, as some folks have alluded to, that um, a lot of these assessments are driven by the what, what a realtor, somebody else would call the comps, right? The comparables. How, uh, what sort of houses were sold in that uh, direct area or uh, and, and there are parts of the city that are disproportionately affected. You know, there are parts of the city, uh, well, on average, we know that just the residential, since we're talking about mostly residential uses in here today, I think the average is about 8.7%. But there are places with little to no increase and places that I'm aware of that have 18, 19% increases. So uh, they are really um, based on the specific area, the type of the house, etc. cetera. Um, if you want to go deeper with the assessor, certainly we can bring them to the April 1 meeting. Okay. Or tomorrow night. 
I think that mm. I think it might be helpful, especially so that folks understand that it's an independent, it's it, the way the government is set up, it's set up as an independent assessor's office. Absolutely. Right? Yes. And just for clarity, we're going to have public hearings on all, all of this stuff yes. still coming. So I just. Right. Yeah. All right, Mr. Blair. Uh, one clarification I know uh, Mr. Fogel's back in the audience, but I know there's been some questions about. Um, the policy, so to speak, concerning releasing personnel records. The city code does provide that the Department of Human Resources, pursuant to the city manager's approval, does issue personnel regulations. Uh, those regulations do, in fact, and they apply to police officers as they do to all city employees. Those regulations currently state that uh, the personnel files are not to be disclosed to other persons. Um, outside of the city government. Now, obviously, they can be changed, but that is where the policy currently resides. There are city personnel regulations in, that do, in fact, state that all city employees' personnel files are private except for the administration of government. All right. Thank you. All right, so. Um, can I just do this real quick? Oh, yeah. But earlier this evening, um, Council appointed the following individuals to the Region 10 Community Services Board, Linda Hansen and Andre Lewis. Thank All right, thank you. We will <laughs> break until um, 8.35. We need to vote on the appointment. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, um, so we just need to vote on the appointment. Um, so I move that we appoint. Sorry. Second. Is there a second? second. All right, please vote. Thanks, Kat. <laughs> this has been a hard night already. Yeah. <laughs>